Looking for Cows Audio presents Saku of the Skull Talkers by M.P. Temple, as read by the author. Episode 1. Sakura Tomatachi had spent the morning by the river, filling a silo of buckets of river water. Other villagers had worked for weeks on an irrigation system to help them with their recent drought, but had run into problems with some of the local wildlife. So they had elected poor Saku to fill up the water bin, while the others kept the area safe. I'm tired of this. Curse the conquerors, Saku said to herself. Her hands were cold from the river, but her face was warm from a heat not expected in a coastal village. She looked to the top of the foothill at the container, relieved that the work was almost complete. But by the next day, all the water would be gone, sent off into bamboo tubes to the thirsty green tea plants on the slopes below. Then she'd start out the next morning, refilling the bin. Until told otherwise, that would be her life. If you think you are tired now, I have some bad news. A voice came from behind Saku. A woman approached, wearing a dark cloak, complete with a quiver of arrows and a long black stained bow that hung on her shoulders. She squinted into the sun towards the water silo. And be thankful the conquerors took over and stopped us from eating those crazy blossoms. Can you imagine if we all still wandered around talking to those dead things all the time? Easy for you to say, Mibu. Saku pressed and cooled her forehead with her still cold hands. You haven't had to carry water up the mountain all morning. Saku shook her head. No, I haven't. I've been on duty on the outskirts, defending the village, actually doing something that was asked of us. Saku's muscles ached as she lifted the bucket and walked back up the hill. I am doing something. I told you I've been taking water up. Like they asked of me yesterday. She shook her head. You did. I could see you from my post, filling up the wrong silo. Mibu's upper lip rose for an instant but flattened. They said fill up the west water silo by evening, Saku cried. They did. Mibu crossed her arms, and now the east water silo is filled and ready for the next season's crops. But the west silo is unfilled. You're joking, Mibu. That way is west. You're having fun with me. Saku pointed at the silo. Wait, no, the sun is in the wrong place. I filled up the wrong one, didn't I? Mibu pointed. You need to hurry, she said playfully. Whack! Cold water splashed on her bare feet. Having been too deep in thought, Saku discovered she had unknowingly dumped all the water from inside the bucket onto the thirsty ground. She cursed. Mibu bent over laughing. You didn't think for once to check to make sure you were going to the right one? Oh, Saku, why must you always do this to me? Saku tried to calculate how long it would take to fill the silo, counting on her fingers as if that would give her an answer. It did not. I don't believe in thinking, she said. Mibu uncrossed her arms. Come on, let's get this filled. I thought you were on duty, Saku asked. Mibu grabbed an empty bucket and dipped it into the waters. She gave Saku a look that made her feel uneasy. I was, until I saw you heading up the wrong side of the mountain. I'm here to do your job. Again. Of course. Saku's eyes wandered in the direction of the village, Fukui. Why can't I do anything right? Mibu placed a hand on her shoulder. I am used to you disappointing me. That is my curse. We are lucky to have one of her own in charge. She takes it easy on us. You remember what Yataku's people used to do to workers who made mistakes? Or knew about people like us? The memories flashed before Saku's eyes. Memories she did not like to dwell on. She also didn't like being called a curse. Mibu went on. We need to finish before the gathering tonight. Before anyone finds out I left my post, Rusu would really be ticked off if she knew that. Gathering? Why are we having a gathering? Is this about the drought? Oh, Saku, Mibu said, shaking her head. She sighed before walking past, carrying two buckets. It's been talked about for weeks. I know not. But all Fukui 
is summoned. You think they'll miss me if I don't show up? Sokka refilled the container and ran up the hill to meet her. Something caught her foot, and the next thing she knew, she had fallen and was feeling wet dirt on her face. Don't worry, I will always protect you, Ibu said. You're the best sparring partner ever. Though, if you keep spilling water, we are never going to finish. And someone's going to find out. She helped Saku to her feet. I will make it up to you. Someday. Somehow, Saku said. After completing the task, which with the help of Mibu was much quicker, they made their way to the temple in the middle of the village. Some others still dressed in their working clothes came out of their longhouses, the roofs covered with dying grass. The two noticed the people had already gathered. Rusu looked at both of them walking in late. Her eyes narrowed. They didn't say what this was about? Saku asked Mibu, looking into one of the longhouses. In the middle was a garden with a shriveled tree. People used to grow their own food in the old days, keeping their own crops. But lately, no one had been able to grow much. It's hard to grow crops in dust. Do they ever tell us anything, Saku? Why is Rusu looking at us? Mibu said. They tell us to work faster and not to have feelings. Saku sneered. Other than that, I think we are in trouble, she said. They passed the dry pond under the giant arch, joining the others near one of the older shrines. After they had taken their place, Rusu nodded at them. She then addressed the crowd next to a cherry tree, whose blossoms looked withered. This morning came word from Sal Song. They informed me they have increased their tea and rice tax, and have doubled their tribute demand. We will need to quicken our pace if we wish to meet this. We need to minimize our mistakes, like making sure we deliver things to the correct place, Rusu said. Saku heard a few laughs. Mibu's eyes widened. Others began to bicker aloud. Saku raised her voice. Double? The amount of tea they want is ridiculous. Don't they drink anything else? Mibu gave a friendly but firm jab to Saku's ribs. Stop speaking. We are in danger. Rusu's eyes caught Saku's. Your attachment to Mibu seems unnatural. Our business is our own. Saku said, feeling the villagers' eyes turn upon them. You're still talking, Mibu said, hitting Saku a second time in the ribs. You're gonna get us both. The conquerors have requested this shipment of the forbidden tea be brought to the city as soon as possible. Lord Yataku is hosting a grand meeting to calm relations with the other lords in the land. As you know, the others who have been sent out on this task did not return. I feel like this is a good job for you, Mibu. Saku's hand caught Mibu's as she tried to hit her again for speaking. Saku threw her hand aside. No, I will go, Saku said, stepping forward. Laughter erupted. Some people clapped. Saku stood looking into Mibu's light brown eyes. Let me go with her, Mibu said, turning in a panic back towards the speaker. Let me guard her to ensure that. No, Rusu said. Maybe that is one job Saku can do correctly. You are to depart tomorrow after the sixth morning bell. Please, she doesn't know what she's doing. I will go, Mibu shouted. But all of the villagers left, leaving the two behind alone. She kicked at the dirt ground. We need to get out of here, tonight. No, Saku said. You know what happens to those who try to leave. The conquerors find them every time. I must travel to Sao Song alone. This is the only way your village will ever accept us for who we are. Maybe others will start seeing how unfair living like this is. It doesn't matter if it's fair, Saku. This is the way it has to be if you want to keep living. And speaking out only makes it worse. What are we supposed to do then? Saku said. Keep working harder and keep living on less and less? We have to do what we need to to keep on going, Mibu said. That is the only choice. 
That is why we should leave. If anything ever happened to you, I'd never be able to forgive myself. I weren't we meant for more, Mibu? We're meant to grow the conqueror's tea. That's all, she said. Then I will prove to you that you are meant for more. Mibu hung her head. Stay safe. And when in doubt, don't say anything. Please, come back. I'll be back, Saku said. I'll show everyone. I'll even bring you something back from the market she always tell me about. She smiled, but Mibu did not. The next morning, six bells rang echoing throughout the dusty hills. Saku gathered the rest of her meager rice rations and returned to the temple. To her surprise, no one greeted her in the small closed-off structure. The row house was usually guarded, but not that morning. She entered, seeing a large grass-woven pack overstuffed with what she assumed was the forbidden tea. However, this kind Saku had not seen before. Most of the villagers had not seen this before. Only special handlers were allowed to prepare the flower petals in that location using ingredients sent from Shao Song. She knew she should have made some travel rice balls the night before for the day-long journey, but after carrying water all day, her back and forearms throbbed with soreness. Rice is also used as money, and she knew if she wanted to buy anything in the markets, she would need to eat light. At least, she would not have to carry water for the next few days, being able to stop by the river along the way. Bag was so heavy and overfilled, Saku buckled at the knees when placing it on her back. That's a whole lot of tea. She found herself chuckling at the insane amount of rich scented petals. So much, none of them were even allowed to drink. She thought about what she had heard about her people in the past, and how the conquerors had banned the flowers that turned them mad. The villagers were known to carry around skulls all day. They weren't allowed to talk about those times anymore. Not out in the open, at least. Felt strange to her that suddenly she were allowed not only to carry it, but deliver it. She wondered why. The conquerors could drink it without anything happening. Why would they be offering it to other nations? Saku looked around the temple before setting out. The entire village was still covered in thick dusk. She pulled at her jacket. I better get going, she thought. But then she paused and looked about. She had no idea which direction Sal's song was in, especially with the dust. I guess I'll figure it out, she said. After a few hours, the dust would be lifted, and she would see the western mountains and would be able to find the city from there. So she set out, not knowing where she was going. Saku had seen Mibu once head to Sao Song on the road outside the temple, so she picked that way and began to walk, hoping she headed in the right direction. The dust did not lift after six hours of walking. Though Saku was confident she was still heading in the right direction, for the road still lay under her feet. Her stomach growled. She knew she would need to stop and prepare something soon, but Shao Song must have only been a few hours away. But she looked down to what she thought was the road and only saw dirt ground. What happened to the road, she said, stomping her feet. She could see nothing but the dust. Well, I'm doomed. That didn't take long. Suddenly, Saku heard a voice behind her. What are you looking for, stranger? She quickly turned and saw a man standing behind her, the dust seemingly lifted around him. I'm looking for the village of Sal Song, she answered. She noticed the man was wearing an outfit she also had, a dress of a very bright orange color. He had a crazy haircut that looked funny to Saku. I thought this way would take me there. You're almost a Sal Song, the man replied. Saku recognized his dialect to be one of the conquerors. If you follow me, I can take you there. It's down the road from here. We could be there within the next few hours. All I ask is for a little cooked meal. I'm starving, she said. If you help me find water, I'll prepare onigiri. You can take me the rest of the way? I'll take you the rest of the way, the stranger agreed, grinning. 
What's that on your back? T, Saku said. The man took a few steps towards her and smiled. You are one of those skull people they keep finding dead, aren't you? He said. Saku began to follow him, having been taught to obey all conquerors' orders. But she stopped. She looked and asked, What's your name? The man turned around and smiled. He held onto the handle of a large katana. Just call me Yayashi. Nearby, she could hear the sounds of a stream. From beneath the dust, a massive tent appeared in front of them. The front and back of the tent allowed air in, and a large side flap allowed entrance. It looked to Saku as if the man lived there. Ayashi took off his katana and placed it inside. She wandered, looking at the stream before turning to the fire pit in the middle of the encampment. That's a nice sword, Saku said, pointing at the large katana laying now in the tent. I need one of those if I'm going to be traveling, huh? Ayashi smirked. You can't have this one. I claimed it recently. It is so new I haven't even tested it out yet. Saku was listening. She was rummaging in her pack. You have a pot to cook rice in? I seem to have forgotten my cookware. After a few moments, Ayashi brought a large pot with a heavy lid along with a pan. He lit the fire and placed an iron grid over the stone pit. Get cooking, he said, and cook some of these. He handed her four large eggs. What are these? Saku asked. Duck, he said. He pointed to a spot near the stream. There feathers lay, along with the corpse of a bird. Its bare skull seemed to be looking at Saku. She turned away. I'll get everything started, she began to cook. As she did, Ayashi put a kettle filled with river water on the fire. The rice turned out wet and mushy. Saku prepared the soggy onigiri anyways with the burnt egg inside. Ayashi handed her a black cup made from clay. The liquid inside was so dark she could not see the bottom. Drink this, he said, trying to swallow the food she had prepared. What is it? Saku didn't look before drinking. She had drunk all of it before Ayashi spit the onigiri on the ground. Let's call it sake, he said, taking another bite. Wow, that was easy. Now before we leave, I want you to help me test out my katana. What do I need to do? Saku sat the empty cup down and began to leap to her feet. She stumbled. She felt her eyes grow warm and her mind began to wander. Before she realized it, she could only focus on the sound of a laughing man. You don't need to do anything, he said. It looked like he was walking towards the tent. What did you do to me? Saku asked, trying to get control of herself, but Ayashi did not answer. He prepared his weapon for it to be tested. Saku tried to regain her footing. Inside her mind, thoughts violently began to swirl. Images of her people appeared, but not like some of the old paintings she had seen once that the conquerors had destroyed, but people telling her many things. As hard as she tried, she could not grasp what they were saying. Run! A voice inside her mind cried. Other voices joined. Run! She realized she couldn't tell what was real anymore. The lines had seemingly blurred after drinking whatever she had drank. She suddenly heard another voice, but this one seemed more real. They're telling you to run, stupid, it said. Saku's eyes darted in the direction of the voice. It seemed to be coming from the skull of a duck. Don't call me an idiot, Saku said. You don't have time to argue, the skull said. Run! Saku ran towards the stream. Not that way, the skull cried. She turned around, but there stood a Yashi with the katana raised. Let's see how sharp this is, he told her. He swung down towards her. She rolled out of the way, barely missing the blade. Ayashi charged at her again, but she was able to move out of the way. She had no idea what was going on. Laying on the ground, surrounded by chunks of bone, the skull said, I'm not sure why I have to keep telling you this so much, but run. 
She kicked the man's leg. He dropped the sword. She rolled by the skull, grabbing it, and ran as fast as she could into the forest. Without the tea. You get your hands off my eye holes? I can't see, said the skull in the palm of Saku's hand. She dropped it on the forest ground and took a step back, reaching out to take a hold of a dark red barked tree covered in moss. Her hands covered her mouth, partly in shock, and a little because of the fog of dust that still lingered. I don't like it down here. Pick me up, the duck skull said. What are you? Saku bent down, keeping her distance. Voices cried out from where she did not know. They seemed to be speaking in her mind. She fought the dried out the multitude of voices. What does it look like I am? said the skull. I'm a duck, and I'm dead? I thought that was easy to follow. She placed the palms of both hands on her head and dug her fingers through her hair into her scalp. I must be crazy. She stood to her feet, taking a few steps away and shouting, How are you talking? That's like asking how you are breathing. Everything dead talks. Your people listen and everything is kept in balance. Which, by the way, you'll have done a horrible job with that in the past hundred years or so. We help you out? What are you talking about? That man tricked me, she said. The ex-samurai you were cooking for like you were married? He said. That man was a samurai? Saku dropped down on her knees to address the talking deceased thing. The one who wanted to cut me in half all of a sudden? No, the other one. Duh. Ex-masterless samurai. Ronin. That's what those crazy people do. Go around trying to cut people in half for fun. I think after you've killed a couple hundred people in battle, your moral compass goes straight out the window, along with your sense of fashion. Saku blushed. I have that same dress. The skull didn't reply for a moment. I said what I said. Why are you acting like this is new to you? You've drank that tea before, haven't you? You had your 18th year tea celebration, whatever you do? We're not allowed to drink the tea. We haven't been allowed to for a long time. It makes us talk to... Wait, that's why I'm talking to you now, isn't it? You're responding only in my head. She dropped the skull on a mossy rock, which bounced before landing in the bush. Huh? No, I'm really talking to you. Come on, you scullies know this. That's what my mother always told me. You take care of the wild and keep everything in balance. We quack a lot. Everyone does their part and all that. No one told you about this agreement? What do you do all day now? Work. Growing tea? Tea that I need to get back from Ayashi and deliver to the city before they do something to Mibu. The skull looked at Saku strangely. You're growing tea? Why? How am I supposed to get my bag back from that torso-chopping happy ex-samurai? Did a skull person of the ultimate magic arts seriously just ask how they can defeat an ex-samurai? You ask that like you don't know you can command undead armies and summon lightning from the sky. Saku blinked. She picked the creature back up again. I'm sorry, what do you think my people can do again? Are you really a skull person? You don't sound like it, he said. Skull, attack that tree. She pointed at the skinniest, weakest tree her eyes could see. Skull person, no. It said. My name is Kamo, by the way. She held Kamo in her hands, checking its eye holes. See, Kamo, I can't command undead armies or shoot lightning from my eyes. I'm a normal person. Of course you can't shoot lightning out of your eyes. That would be silly. I said you can shoot lightning from the sky. Saku turned Kamo back in the direction of Ayashi's camp. If I don't get that tea delivered, I don't know what the conquerors are going to do to me or my village. If Kamo could have rolled his eyes, he would have. Maybe one of them in your village can call on the wild for aid? Someone who knows what they're doing? Maybe this craziness will wear off, and soon I'll just be holding a dead duck skull, feeling silly yet gross about myself. I'm going to leave you here, and I'm going to go wash my hands, she said. Dude's going to drink your tea if you don't go do something, Kamo said. 
and you need my help. Don't leave me down here. I can't walk. I have no legs, Saku. She sighed. I can't. You aren't real. I am very real. Pick me along and let me prove it to you. When the tea doesn't wear off and you realize the things you can do, you are going to want me. And if I stop talking, then you can leave me. She thought about what everyone would think if somehow someone back in the village knew what had happened. Memories of other people from Pukui not coming back, or even worse, the times the conquerors had strung up the bodies of those who were unable to do their duties as assigned, came to her mind. I don't have a choice, she said. I'm going to prove I can do things without me, boo. I will take you with me, for now, until I find someone who can cure this. Tea, illness, whatever is going on right now. I'll find a way to fight Ayashi long enough to grab the bag. All without letting the people in the castle know where I am. She carried Kamo in her arms towards the camp. You didn't even bring a weapon, he said. Saku didn't reply. Yikes. Better grab a stick or something. She held the skull close to her face and narrowed her eyes. I'll drop you. 